Good morning, good morning, good morning. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started because we, uh, we will definitely stop right at noon today in case uh, any of you need to move on. Uh, I'm not sure what Brendan's schedule is, if he needs to vacate right at noon, but if not, uh, we have the room for a while so we can continue to come conversate if we need to, but uh, I know we have a lot to cover and I suspect this will be a, a lively topic today. Uh, so we want, what we're talking about today are uh, badges, uh, MSU badges and the badging process. Um, so what we're kind of looking for today is a little bit, Brendan's going to give us uh, a little bit of an overview of what badges are, what badges look like at MSU, what the process is at MSU. And then we hope to have uh, a discussion, uh, an opportunity to ask questions, an opportunity to perhaps share how maybe you're thinking about using badges or not thinking about using badges, uh, ways in which uh, programming that you are creating might benefit from an approach. So that's kind of what we're thinking about for the hour. So please um, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Brendan Gunther, uh, Director of IT Services Teaching and Learning. Happy to have him with us today. So you're all really lucky and fortunate to be at Michigan State, given that we're going to talk about this topic today, because we've got some forward-thinking leadership uh, at MSU Global, and with uh, Nicole Roving in the Registrar's Office, um, who's willing to entertain some kind of free-thinking discussions with us about uh, badges and how badges might be used at MSU. And I think we've got more than uh, more than a half-baked understanding of how this might fit in, at least where it's safe to start. Um, we're also going to cover today some things that um, kind of push the edge of the envelope a little bit. I'd say this whole topic kind of pushes the edge of the envelope a little bit. So I covered some basic assumptions I have, my kind of thinking about the, I don't know, the larger trends in the industry that lead us to badges, how badges came about. We're talking about what a digital badge is. Um, where the idea came from, why you might want to earn one or, or issue one um, as an institutional provider, um, how institutions are beginning to use them. I'd say we're really kind of on the early test of this, and how it might fit in an MSU. And then that, um, I, I invite you to jump in and, and tell me what you think or how it might apply both ways. So here's some of my assumptions, and I, I won't read them all to you. I'll let you read that. I'm assuming everyone in the back can read that. Um, yep. Okay, too good. Um, but the key thing down at the bottom that I'm driving towards with all of these are that use of competencies to describe educational outcomes is going to become more and more common. It already is becoming common. We see it working its way into accreditation standards, um, even in um, employer-based, like on-the-job training, formal training programs. We see this used to describe both what they're looking for in employees and what they expect people to be able to do in order to slot into a certain job role. Um, Obviously, there's some things going on in the, in the global realm in terms of other institutions springing up. The for-profit sector is what, where we see the most expansion in the United States, so meet demand. Um, all of these things, including online education, are kind of leading us to a very hard kind of credit requirement or skill requirement um, outcomes measure for a degree. It doesn't appreciate some of the things that like a selective residential college like MSU brings to the table. Um, so, one of the things I think that we're going to be challenged to do at MSU is to not fall into the lowest common denominator debate about degrees being equivalent to each other everywhere and try to figure out over the next 25 years, how do we differentiate MSU? How do we differentiate the kind of experience that we provide our students? And I would, I would say that covers the whole spectrum from the traditional age college student that comes here for a bachelor's degree as well as people coming here for continuing education, master's degrees, um, and lifelong learning. So this is a chart that I borrowed from the Lumina Foundation. Um, this comes from their degree qualifications profile. So this would be an example of a foundation that, that is advancing the agenda of we need millions of more college graduates in the United States. And borrowing somewhat from the Bologna process, they're essentially saying, well, if these are different dimensions of skills, so one of those dimensions you probably can't read it is civic learning, another would be applied learning, intellectual skills, specialized knowledge. Can we come up with a way to describe incompetencies, what people get out of a, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or a master's degree, such that if colleges were able to stack together the competencies they claim their students are earning, could we essentially say that the degree from college A is equivalent to the degree from college B? 
And this is really just here as an example of how competencies are working their way into the broader discussion about what, what's in the degree. Um, so you can probably can't read that either, but this is how they break it down. So at the bachelor's level, this is really just kind of zooming in at the, uh, I don't know, thousand times magnification layer. Um, at the bachelor's degree, the student should be able to define and explain the boundaries of major subfields, styles, and or practices of the field. So that's a huge broad competency still, right? But you stack a bunch of these together and you start to see what they mean by degree equivalency. So this comes from another Lumina Foundation publication, the degree qualifications profile. Um, and I'm not suggesting that at MSU we do anything crazy like jump into the degree equivalency game. Um, this is really more a demonstration of the broader pressures that do the competencies. So getting back into uh, digital badging, what is a digital badge? Um, so get some definitions straight here. Um, it's essentially a certified visual symbol that I can use to represent my ability. So if you remember Boy Scout badges, Girl Scout badges, right? They, you stack them together in a vest or, or something like that. And in this case, we could stack them together on a web page or a portfolio or my resume. Uh, a digital badge essentially creates a web standard for this. So this means now that we've got a way on the web in a standardized format to express some data and some metadata. So in this case, the data would be the badge image. And so metadata is data about data, right? So underneath that image are a bunch of other things explaining what that badge means. So if you think of it um, as the equivalent of a, of a Boy Scout or Girl Scout badge, you not just get the badge that you just saw in your uniform, but in the book that you earned it from, like the wolf book or the brownie book, there'd be a whole bunch of descriptions that say you have to do this and that and the other in order to earn that badge. If anyone ever asked you, most of the scouts can recite what they did in order to earn the badge. That's the metadata. And that's what gets essentially um, hidden behind the scenes, but the machines can read it. And theoretically, you dig for it, you can read it. But the, the whole point here is to provide something that has visual appeal, but is machine readable. So the idea came from um, some of the Microsoft laboratory work. Um, the US Army has been obviously doing stuff like this for a long, long time. The Army and the Armed Forces in the United States have a huge, huge training program. If you think about it, their job is to crank out 18-year-olds that come in not knowing not much more than a basic high school education, if even that, because they think if you don't have that even, right? And they crank you out with a military occupational specialty, which means you have to learn a ton post-basic training before you're actually on the job. And if you think about like what takes for an aircraft carrier or something like that in the Navy, it's a whole floating city, right? You've got just about every occupational specialty known to man. Um, so they've been thinking a lot about competencies, and they've had competencies for a long time in their programs. Um, Scouting obviously talked about earlier. So this kind of crossed over into the educational realm um, with some theorists like Hubert Baker. Um, did a lot of work in the, the ERA about this. Um, more recently, in like the uh, EduPunk movement, we've seen things like Peer to Peer University and the Mozilla Foundation. Um, Chris mentioned last Friday during Ryan's presentation that. Um, Chris and I were actually at the Open Education Conference in Barcelona, and I figured out where it was because I deleted my travel for, um, authorization from my computer. Cleaning <laughs> 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 up file virtual, finishing this, and uh, I found the travel authorization for Barcelona, so it was 2010. 2010, um, okay. And co-booked with the Open Education Conference, the Mozilla Foundation had a uh, conference there to essentially talk about what if we made the badge a web standard. So this is a really new thing, it's only about three years old. They were really into it because as a web development professional, you've got all these skills you've got to do um, that are really hard technical skills that you call incredibly rapidly. Right there are new standards come out every six months or so. You can be an expert last year and next year, not so employable. Um, very hard to keep up with 21 year olds in this space as a 37 year old. Um, so there's continuous pressure to learn and to master new skills and new technical standards and to demonstrate that you can do it, because often in this industry you're, you're um, freelancing or moving from one creative firm to the next. Um, so they had some incentive to do that to support their own set body of, of professionals, but they also thought, well, perceiving this need in our own ranks, what can we do to express this as a web standard that would be relevant to all industries and would help with educational reform? And so they took up this open badges platform and open badges um, standard. And so open badges have been out on the web for a couple of years now. This is essentially the pitch from the, the Mozilla Foundation. They're free and open, so it's not proprietary, it's free software, it's an open standard. Any organization can use it. Um, as a consumer badge, if you're issued a badge, you can take them anywhere, They're highly portable. Um, doesn't matter whether I get it from MSU or Mexican Community College or Skillsoft or some other um, training provider or even my employer. I can collect those badges across all those sources and take them with them and display them anywhere, my portfolio, LinkedIn, any place. Any place I can upload an image to the web. 
uh, allows you to knit your skills together essentially and demonstrate um, beyond your formal education, beyond your job experience, kind of skills and competencies that you have. This is particularly helpful when you are launching out into the workforce for the first time, right? When you have to differentiate yourself from a bunch of other people who have a degree that looks kind of the same. Um, I'm always uh, a little intimidated when I see the, um, the number of MBA students graduating every semester from any college like MSU. Giant crowd of them, right? How do you stand out in, in a crowd when there's 200 people coming from the same school you came from every single year? Um, likewise, I think when you're changing careers or when you're trying to enter into a specialty, you need an internal transfer in your company. Um, one of the co-presenters in the panel on Friday about that is they were talking about um, product counterfeiting. And that's not a degree that you're going to get probably, but yet it's a strong industry need, right, across a number of um, different industry verticals. So if you're a supply chain person or if you're a marketing person or you're, if you're um, a law enforcement liaison, how do you demonstrate that you've picked up the kind of knowledge and competencies in that specialty area that might make you stand out from somebody else? So the National Pool of Information, each badge has that metadata that I talked about baked into it that really allows it to go, you can go back to the provider and validate that the person actually did earn the badge. And you can learn what does the badge actually represent, as we talked about, what did I, what did I demonstrate how this year, what do I know how to do, um, as well as the criteria, which is kind of what did I demonstrate in order to show that I have the competency. How, how much is in a badge? Is there, is there a... Um, I'll show a screenshot of the actual metadata. It's actually relatively lightweight, and I'll show you the screenshot of the badge system we have, which is like, I think, everything that conforms to the standard, and you'll see the, the fields that you have to fill out. Um, so key attributes of a badge, as, as the person that earns the badge, you have complete control. And this is one of the important things that we figured out based on the standard would help us kind of comply with what we expect out of student privacy. Um, if we wouldn't be disclosing the records, it's in the power of, in our we use this term show me the the student gets to control um, the release of the data. So I get to control which badges I share as a participant. Um, you can manage them, delete them, do whatever you want with them. Um, when you're looking at the badge, you get this portal to all the places that I talked about to, to prove what the badge um, does. And these are, again, human readable. So if I select the badge as a person, if I drill into it, I can see these. But they're also machine readable. So if a machine scans your resume and you've got 100 badges on it, the machine's going to make a lot of sense out of what you know how to do. Yeah. And in the long run, I think we're going to see more and more um, computerized sorting of resumes happen. And it's happening already because we've been scanning resumes for years. But imagine a resume that, that has much richer metadata than just optical character recognition. So a little bit more about what, what, what people are going to use out of this course. So this is different perspectives. Um, one way to look at this is you can use it just to motivate people. Right, so my example of this is, uh, you see this in the gaming industry a lot nowadays. Video games have these little badges you are, uh, particularly platforms like, um, oh, forget the name of it, the um, PlayStation or the Xbox network, where you get these social networks where you're gaming online with other people. Um, then when you show up on a team and, and you're playing a game and nobody knows you, to differentiate yourself from a noob, you go to these badges that say, oh, you've been playing the game for a long time and you've mastered those various elements of, of gameplay. Um, uh, my favorite example of this, uh, in terms of the effect it has on motivation, uh, I can't remember which game it is, it's one of the guitar point games. They've got a, a, an award that you can get called Bladder of Steel. In order to earn this badge, you have to play the game without pausing from start to finish. We did the entire game in one gaming session, which takes, I think, seven and a half hours. Um, oh. years play. They could also call it the Carpal Tunnel Badge, I think. <laughs> And people go and, and they earn this badge, which shows you that just the intrinsic motivation of getting one more little award that means nothing. Yeah. To make points to <laughs> um, people will do crazy things. So if you apply that to a course in some way, you can you know, gamify your course. Um, I think learners are motivated to get these because they make learning a little more fun. Um, you get these tangible milestone progress. We've been doing things like that for years, just throwing up flags in the LMS when you complete various modules so you get this kind of sense of progress and satisfaction. Um, these have pretty pictures. <laughs> uh, but also, anyone that's forward thinking, like how am I going to get a job? How, what, how, anyone building a portfolio. This gives you a very tangible thing to you move your portfolio. Um, organizations will probably use them because it gives you a form of alternative credentialing, right? So if, we're, if we are trying to explain our program at a greater depth than the credit hour or the credit equivalency, um, this gives you a very deep language. Now, it takes a lot of work to articulate that language, but it gives you a very deep way to do that. Um, 
networks, and by networks I kind of mean, I guess, social networks or job sites or um, professional organizations. There's a variety of forms of those things nowadays. I think those are increasingly going to be used to, to bring these things in and represent membership. Um, so people take pride not just in their own accomplishments, but in kind of ex exposition um, to other people. And as I said earlier, the automation that comes into play in these things um, is likely to have a bigger and bigger effect on how people find individuals to go and recruit. Hey, Brendan, speaking yeah. of the automation, can you just touch, without getting too technical, talk, touch briefly on what's it called, the tin can protocol or the new standard? API. Yeah. I mean, I, essentially, this is a this is a representation of um, what we refer to in the industry as, as Web 3.0. So, if Web 1.0 is just publishing HTML pages. That was the read-only web. Web 2.0 was the read-write web. So you see things like blogs, um, inline editors all over the place. Much more ability to comment, where it becomes a very interactive experience on on most websites. Um, things like Facebook. Um, Web 3.0 um, is the linked data web. And essentially what that allows us to do is to embed metadata inside the page. So um, you've seen Creative Commons licensing, I imagine. We'll see symbol, it's a copy license. When you embed a Creative Commons license on a work, um, it links back to the license using the same kind of metadata, the same, the same web format. So embedded in behind the Creative Commons image that implies that you have like a, a Creative Commons license applied, it also goes back to the, creative, the actual Creative Commons license. And that's human readable and it's machine readable. So if I click on it, I go to the Creative Commons page, I can read more about your license. Right? And I can even port your license to my home country. I can find in Portugal reading your license. I can figure out how to translate your United States work to virtual copyright law. Um, likewise, a machine also picks that up. So nowadays, if you go to Google Image Search, you can search for images. And if you go to the advanced options, you can say, I want images that are tagged for reuse, that are licensed for reuse. Now you're going to get only images that have Creative Commons license applied to them. That way you know you're free. Any image you see in that search, you can go and apply it to your presentation um, and cite it. Um, I'm not entirely sure how exactly this will translate for Commons. Um, so frankly, no one's implemented it yet. But Creative Commons has been out there for, I don't know, almost 10 years now, I think. Um, this has only been out there for three, so give it a couple more years, maybe. Yeah, um, I think the the the, um, the idea behind the, this new API standard is it builds on that so that people can create applications for like every correct test answer you get from an LMS that was being published to the web as opposed to you know contained inside MSU can be listened to by a search engine and collected and then assembled in a dynamic document of some type you know your website yeah. or a virtual resume or something like that so pieces of things that are badge eligible could be created and automatically, with no human intervention, fed into a collection tool of some type. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, I think, what's coming in the future. Yeah, these building yeah. blocks are there. Yeah. They're just not assembled into a value chain that is consumer ready, whether you're the, whether we're talking about educational institutions or the, the, the learners. But it's <coughs> um, right now, like with the badges that I'm the EDU, the demonstration system we got, which is say in beta, or pilot, I guess, um, it's ready for use. But it really involves a lot of manual going to badges by you as the educational provider and then embedding those someplace. So we can do a like controlled release through Desire to Learn, but it doesn't do anything as automatically as like pushing Chris a feed as a participant in, in a course that Ryan makes um, for the badges that she earns as she's getting assessment questions right. So you can assemble the components by hand right now, but I'd say as the educational provider, very, very labor intensive. And we will increasingly see, because open badges is really just a metadata standard that it gets incorporated into other systems, automated through APIs between systems. Um, right now, a lot of manual shuttling of um, mm -hmm. Microsoft QR codes. So moving into possible applications in MSU. We've all talked about T-shaped professionals at MSU a lot. Um, get into that a little bit. Um, electronic portfolios have been used for writing places on campus. Those are becoming more and more advanced and frankly leaving the boundaries of institutions like us. Um, alternative credentialing, like we did some MOOCs. Uh, what, you know, as participants, what do you want out of a MOOC? We're not giving you credit, you know that, you're not really paying anything, but you know, how do you, what do you get? Um, certificates, um, I think badges are very much equivalent to the PDF certificates we've been taking up for years. Um, and then maybe some things related to building a co-curricular record. Um, at an institution like MSU, this residential, we want 
look through the record. So, I don't remember the, the broad and deep part of the PJ professional. Right, so this, this essentially says you have very broad skills, maybe an ability to apply your skills outside of your discipline across a, a broad area. But your depth there is relatively low, perhaps, on areas outside of your specialty. And this could be a, a certain area, like I was a telecommunications undergraduate when I graduated in college. I was deep in that and some things related to computer science, a little bit of business and not so much anything else. Um, so this comes from uh, Valve, which is a video game company. Um, they're an employer, and this comes from their employee manual. Um, they're essentially saying, we want to only hire t shaped people. If you're too deep in a technical specialty, uh, we'll probably take a pass. If you're a broad generalist and don't have any depth in anything, we'll probably pass. Um, so this is a video game character coming from a Valve game. I don't remember what, what his name is, but uh, I think he's a Russian guy who carries a really big gun. So I'm not sure if you can read it, but um, his example of being T-shaped is uh, he's a big guy, he's good at sandwich preparation, uh, uber charging, killing people, and uh, Russian folk dancing. But he's really specialized in heavy weaponry. So if we were to apply badges to him, you'd see some interesting variety in terms of his, um, his broad areas. But probably if you were to go in depth, you'd be really specific about exactly what kind of heavy, what heavy weapons he was good at and how exactly good he was at them. Um, I think if you apply that to uh, a degree program or a degree specialization, um, there's some crossover here with portfolios. Um, one of the programs kind of using portfolios is the sustainability specialization. So this is an undergraduate degree endorsement. Am I getting that term right? Specialization. The specialization? Okay. So you take like four or five classes, I think, um, and you do some additional work, I believe, associated with those classes um, to essentially earn that specialization as part of your degree, but it can apply to any, any degree at MSU. Um, and they're using portfolios to demonstrate how the, the students are um, getting things out of these courses and applying them out and above the course in order to earn um, the specialization. And I think they're using it essentially to assess and evaluate whether or not um, the, the programmatic activities they have around this are actually making a difference or whether the student's really just taking four courses. Um, so these are the certificate of completion, right? We've been doing these in online classes since uh, the 90s, I think, at MSU, uh, particularly for non-credit purposes. Um, sometimes people enroll um, in master's level courses um, as a lifelong learner. They don't really intend to complete the master's degree. They're kind of putting four courses together and running a certificate. Um, Often that's a, a little bit more meaty, but um, sometimes people are just enrolling in single things, sometimes on a completely not for credit basis. And they just want something that they can take back to their employer to say, yeah, I learned something. And so we give them these kind of like, you fill it out, PDF, print it. Um, it's not transcripted, it's not held in the registrar's office, it's held maybe at the departmental level, but there's really not a lot of guarantee over record keeping. You recall back 15 years later and dial up them as you blow over the department with a faculty member. Uh, you'd probably be challenged to find anyone that could validate whether or not you're in the certificate um, and they're highly forgeable. Um, the other one is uh, Lynda.com certificate. They don't test for these. It's basically a certificate of completion. Um, it doesn't signify competency in anything. Um, it doesn't even really mean that you actually paid attention, right? Because it just says you finished the, you, you played all the videos. You didn't have to even stay in the room for them. Um, so these certificates are kind of dubious market value um, in some ways. But we can easily replace these with badges. And if you're issuing one of these now, I would say you should probably definitely issue a badge. I think there's some record keeping benefits that come from issuing a badge. But if nothing else, um, it gives somebody something that's, I, I would say, um, better to put on their resume or in their portfolio than just a PDF certificate. So this is a link in that. Um, on the top of the presentation, there was like a Google URL that takes you here, so you can also come back and find these links in, in Big Go. This is a blog that um, I want companies in this space. This is a really hot sector right now for things that I would say are equivalents to LinkedIn or, replaces, or, or supplements to LinkedIn that attempt to help you build a portfolio or represent your resume online in a, in a beautiful and a deep fashion. Um, and there's more and more startups in this space all the time. So I'm assuming you're all familiar with LinkedIn, the social network for grown-ups. Uh, we've been around for a long time. Um, so this is Pathright. It's essentially a resume site that allows you to put a lot more pictures and multimedia online. Perfect for badges, because a badge at the end of the day is just a, just 
just in graphic, network graphic, or the network graphic, PNG. So it's just an image. So you upload a bunch of magic here as images to your resume and attach, right? And you instantaneously also gain benefit from all the metadata. Anything in the future that can crawl the web looking for people with competencies is going to find your resume and, and digest those badges. Um, this is Visify. Uh, it creates, I think you upload your resume and it creates an infographic automatically. Um, so, a little crazy. Might work better for some firms than others. <laughs> I haven't yet done my resume in there, see what it does with it. Um, this is about uh, me. Um, this is basically just a stylist homepage. But you notice all the links at the bottom. They don't really do much besides just upload a headshot to give you a pretty squashed page for your online presence. But um, if you're not a web developer, it's handy to have one of these and maybe you link to a, a ton of other devices. Um, and really, I'm just throwing these all in here to show how much churn there is in the startup space in this area right now. This is incredible. Credible does a lot of things. Essentially, as the end user, you essentially replicate your transcripts, totally unverified, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it's a, for people that have been more than one collegiate experience, the, the idea is it gives you one place to represent all of your transcripts um, mm -hmm. if you're willing to sit there and pile on all the data. I can't imagine, because I think it would take me like two hours to do iPad perhaps too many credits. But it also gives you a place to put in other things, other things that you know. Um, and one of the things that they're trying to do, or sorry, I think this is their own. Uh, they, they do a little bit of this. There's another one that does um, even more of that. Um, the other thing this thing does is integrate with social networks. So kind of like LinkedIn, I can request endorsements for people that have worked with me that say that I know a certain skill. Uh, this essentially follows a very similar model, uh, which allows past employers or trainers or people that you kind of peer learn with to um, say, yeah, they know this. Um, almost none of these things are totally integrated with badges yet. Um, but I think social certification of a badge is possibly an equally relevant argument to like what is MSU mean by a badge. Um, so this is degree, this is definitely where you pile up um, all of your credit hour stuff. So you can see the 136 credit hours in the bottom left. But you also have this mastery points, and that speaks more to competencies. So they're attempting to blend both together and create something like a FICO score for learning, which I think is a yeah, dubious proposition, but we're seeing. Um, one, and, and notice the, uh, this is very typical in this space. The guy on the top has a holding up a cardboard sign that says education is broken, someone should do something. Um, most of these companies take the standpoint that established interests like us are not meeting everyone's needs, so they need to do something different. And they get money from venture capitalists to do so. Yeah, this is a hot space for investment, right? It is. If you have a good idea, you can get a couple money bucks. <coughs> um, and then turn your company in the ground. Most of these people have figured out a business plan that involves monetization of these ideas. But, um, you can imagine that some of these companies, if they're successful, will eventually cross over into the non credit space or possibly even into the free frequency space. Um, so, co curricular record. Um, by that, I mean all the other stuff that goes on at a place based institution like MSU. The things you do outside of them, between your classes. So this is a picture of the build a bus project that's been going on for I think a decade at MSU. Um, that's an example of I guess I would call it civic engagement or service learning in a way. Very very loose service learning, more civic engagement. MSU food food bank an example of a student run organization. Right, so students involved in that are obviously picking up hard skills associated with running an organization. Um, there's other more kind of emergent or temporary groups. This is a group of students, I believe, from Caribbean Studies that were responding to the past and um, This is a group of students, I believe, tsunami group, really. Um, but I bet you in doing that work, they figured out a lot of tangible skills. Now, if one, someone was willing to sit down and endorse what that skill was, yeah, possibly there's a chance for one of those organizations to award that to students. This is a college engineering fabrication lab. These things are popping up like crazy. Um, there's a bunch down in the basement of Wilson Hall if you haven't been over there in the last five years. Um, it's terrifying to think of the liability associated with <laughs> sending an 18 year old to use a drill press. Um, my was curious as to whether or not you learned anything about a drill press in high school. Um, at some places, in order to get in, and I don't know what we're doing at MSU, but if it's some fab labs I've toured, um, you essentially carry around kind of like a, along with your MSU badge or the key in the facility, there's these color coded cards that indicate what you've been safety trained on. So that if you're working at a certain station, the stations are color coded as well. And anyone walking by can really quickly verify that you uh, you know what you're doing or use that machine. So like, you know, example, hand placement. Looks relatively safe. I don't know if it is or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Um, this is a fab lab, I believe, in uh, college writers and letters. So that's a maker pot over on the right. Um, another drill press. And I, I think in addition to the safety things associated with physical equipment like drill presses, we also are going to have competencies like, do you know how to use the MakerBot software? You know, do you know how to account for your usage? Um, these things are like the world's most expensive laser printer, right? So we have no, almost no way right now to measure usage. Most things are moving towards a student paid model. This often involves paying the operator to sit in the room in order to measure how much the thing weighs when it comes out four hours later. Um, student research, right? So you've got individual, what, you know, bench skills that you might certify people for. Um, mm. You also have various team-based competencies that come from our, from our research team. These are all examples of things that happen um, all the time in MSU right now that I would find as, as co-curricular. Um, the challenge with issuing badges for these, of course, is that we don't actually have any way administratively to say, I can, I, I'm keeping track of all the activity in MSU and I know everything that somebody's participated in. By handing out badges, it'll definitely equip the students. It wouldn't necessarily give us any clearer of an administrative picture unless the students all literally took those badges and self-represented. If you think about it, it's probably 1% of the population or less at this point in time. So would we be able to assess MSU's co-curriculum or say what's happening in that? Not really. Um, and so again, like speaking to APIs, if we were to have an actual focus for the record system that all these programs used, maybe we could have that crank out badges automatically such that if a student wanted to get a badge from a certain experience, they could. But again, this is all um, like portfolios, being frivolous with people's time to write the competencies, to do the assessments, to certify the learning. This is really expensive, so you've got to be sure that you want to do it. Um, I'm kind of throwing out a lot of radical ideas, but I wouldn't exactly propose doing a quick system system that we all use or are required to use. Hour. Millions of hours, right? Have you seen any systems yet for rating badges? No, but, no, but this, that's, that's part of the, the, that's part of the debate. <laughs> 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 when you think about it, there's going to be a thousand providers will pop up for any given kind of learning area eventually. <laughs> Who's to say these things are a good one, right? This is a zero accreditation system. So if at some point, um, a badge issued by me to say that you know how to do risk management is of equal weight to like the society risk management badge mm -hmm. to the same thing. And eventually there needs to be some kind of a system that, that allows, I guess in, in the web world, um, a distributed endorsement that allows the, the eyeballs to go in place so that that badge eventually carries more weight than, than my personally issued badge. And eventually the hope would be that um, at places like MSU where there's some bazillion opportunities and you're lucky if you bump into them before you four years and out. Um, and this isn't really related to country or something else, but I like the kind of mechanic and projects and people. I think the hope would be eventually this makes it so that there's some kind of social finding that comes with this as well. Okay, so if you want to earn a badge, and this I guess also goes if you want to issue a badge, um, here's kind of the basic noun verb relationships. Um, so this is going to hopefully set some definitions. If I'm the person overseeing your mastery, or conducting the educational program, so to speak. Uh, but it could be, I'm just testing you to see if you have the skill. You don't technically have to do it or any integration, right? You could just be all three qualifications. Mm -hmm. Then I'm the badge issuer. I'm the one giving up the badge, right? As the badge issuer, I get to set the criteria. In other words, what do you have to demonstrate skill in, what do you need to be competent in, in order to earn the badge? Um, I also probably use some kind of a badging system. These could, there's a variety of platforms out on the web that people use. I don't forget the names because we buy each other all the time. Do you remember any? No. I don't know. These are all startups. I didn't include any of those in the presentation. But um, badge.msu would be our internal um, system. Um, and we really implemented something that Seton Hall um, released this open source. I need to give them a little cred. Um, that's a pretty small Catholic institution. How on earth they had enough free time to crank out a badging system? I don't know. So we didn't have enough free time. We used their open code. Um, and hopefully these things increasingly make their way into things like D2L where if you're already declaring a competency in detail, it's just an option to turn it on to activate a badge to or to relate that to an assessment item that indicates whether or not you're in badge. Um, so as a learner, and I, this is a little bit of web-centric, it doesn't necessarily have to be. I say it goes to the issuer's web, website, signs up, performs. It could be you showed up at a seminar like this. Now, if this is an eight-hour seminar, and I was teaching you how to write a competency, use the badge system, and all that other stuff, maybe I could test you before you walk out the door, and I could actually see you learn something. Um, otherwise, it's just an, an attendance, right, which doesn't say much. Um, 
I could give you a QR code or a hyperlink to follow and earn the badge. So if I tested you by paper in the room, I could give you a piece of paper if you pass the test for the URL month that you go to to earn the badge. Um, now again, this is a low security, high trust system, right? It's nothing that prevents you. If, if Mike fails the test and Ryan passes the test, Ryan could share his URL with Mike, right? And they could both earn the badge. And I can, to a certain extent, be none the wiser. Um, and then if a learner in the badge system, you can go and show that badge you've earned, and you can decide whether you want to spoil them anywhere, and you don't want to leave them there, you know, kind of abandoned. Um, as the badge provider in the badge system, I'm not publicly exposing your badges unless you want to. So that, and, and mind you, implementation varies. There's nothing about the standard that enforces this, but this is how people are pretty much universally implementing it, with the expectation that people want privacy and control over what they expose to the lab. So in some cases, uh, and this works well in courses or in, in programs where you're trying to increase motivation, sometimes there's also points associated with the badge. Um, that allows you to, to do the gamification in a group setting, say like a course where there's a bunch of optional activities. Um, there could be a leaderboard. Again, this comes from the video game world, where then I'm creating a kind of uh, friendly competition to see who can earn the most badges this week or on a certain topic or a variety of ways to present that. Um, because there's certain people that they just want to be on the top of the leaderboard or just on the leaderboard, right? So it motivates them to spend maybe perhaps more time on task. Um, so after all of this, um, if, as, the, if, as the learner, if I want to come back and represent my badge someplace else, say on LinkedIn or my portfolio, I might come back to the badge system and bake the badge, which basically means download the image. But in downloading the image, then all the metadata gets encoded and I've got this tangible thing I can take and up someplace else. And we were talking about APIs earlier. The idea would be maybe at some point I can create like a feed like we used to do with blogs, whereas the learner I can say any bed I earn here, I want you to automatically send back, which would essentially automate the baking process. Right now the baking process is manual. It's not exactly speaker net, but it's kind of like uh, click, 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 click to move them around. Um, and then the Mozilla backpack essentially is a place that I can go and take and upload all my badges from a variety of places. And really, they're just providing that because there's no other clearinghouses. Eventually, this will probably be overtaken by other people providing that SM1 service. So this tosses up a whole bunch of challenges at us, um, some of which we think we've addressed with badges that are but many of which I'd say um, we have to. Um, I'm going to say talk to Roger for now. Um, if you want to do a unit issue badge, if you want to do a personal issue badge, you can just kind of just go there and start to it around. Um, you're not going to find anything on tech.msu.edu about this yet. Um, probably we'll publish something in the next couple months. Um, but we are ready to deal with early adopters, so anybody wants to raise their hand, um, you can talk to me or Ryan and Mike or Jen, who are all in the room. Um, we can try to get you started. Depending on what you're trying to do, maybe we're we'll routing you towards an instructional designer to talk about your broader programmatic needs and decide if this is right or how it fits. Maybe we're we'll sending you to MSU Global because you need to define competencies. I think the more that you're externally aligned, the more it makes sense maybe to start with MSU Global. The more it's inside of an MSU course or program, maybe start with um, IP services. Uh, Brian, how, how many people are thinking that they're gonna they're gonna run out of here and, and go back to their office and start this today? Are there are there are there some that are? How many are saying, okay, I, I'll go back and I'll evaluate, and in the next couple of weeks or a month, I might try to apply this to something I'm doing? How many people are in that camp, would you say? So maybe like three or four or five, maybe? Okay. The key for me is, have you done a MOOC? Yeah, I want to know, and, and I, you know, I'm interested in, in how much is, is, is one badge for MSU to, for, for a template, because is it, is it one for the MOOC? It's a four hour MOOC, so maybe it's four. And then executive education, Yeah, we do. Um, also then within the executive education, similar content to inside our graduate course on fraud. And so then could uh, the, we coordinate D2L type things so yeah. you get a MOOC on one or the other. When I think we're, we're, what I would encourage you to do is to boil it down to like, you know, the most marketable skills. And that could be in terms of getting into graduate school or could be in terms of getting a job. But um, the actual tangible learning outcomes or skills that help to differentiate a person, which is probably a much lower level of granularity than completion of a certain learning experience. Yeah. Right? So at the end of the MOOC, hopefully you learn more than one thing. And I think, you know, like writing learning objectives, writing out a whole bunch of competencies takes a lot of time and requires a certain amount of kind of unpacking of your thinking about the program. Oftentimes, this is facilitated by an instructional designer. Um, and it's, lab frankly, labor intensive. Um, but I'd say that's the level at which badges is really expecting you to operate. 
Um, and I'd say also most features in Desire to Learn, where you're actually declaring learning outcomes and competencies, they're expecting a pretty granular approach mapped, um, I think Chris referred to this earlier, almost down to individual assessment items. So there might be a competency that's mapped to certain content items. In other words, that's kind of exposing the, the subject matter expert and the instructional designers thinking about if I've given you these kind of experiences in this content coming out of it, hopefully that's going to contribute to mastery of certain things. But then you're going to test that by mapping those same items to the assessment to essentially test that theory, uh, both for the individual, but also then to go back and assess is the institutional program meeting the, the needs I thought it would. Yeah, it might be useful to define competency as um an assessable statement of a knowledge, a skill, a behavior, or a sensibility. And assessable means not just like a test assessment, but it could be something you observe somebody doing. So if you think of that, think of it that way, that's pretty granular. An assessable statement of knowledge, skills, or behavior mm -hmm. uh, gets pretty small. And it, and it really focuses on, well, is that assessable? Okay, it's not fine-grained enough. You know, and that's where an instructional designer, you know, at MSU Global or on your staff really is useful. And doing it in partnership with whoever your outside group is, not just your internal experts, but your outside group, like you have in food fraud is critical because you need some consensus on what's important. What are those important knowledge, skills, and behaviors in whatever it is you're aiming for? Uh, but that's the opportunity, I think, at MSU, is it strengthens our relationships with our outside partners. Yeah. And reaching that consensus. Because we're a great, we're a trusted partner and convener. And that's one of the things we can do with that relationship, is add this as a value add to that set of the relations. Yeah. So how many people have done like a quick change oil thing sometime in their life? Right, and sat there in the car and watched yeah. and waited. So if you think about that job, if you were to break that down at the competency level, it would probably involve things like understanding the overall process, the steps, right? Which they try to do pretty much the same no matter what car pulls in, right? So that would be one thing. Understand, able to able to, able to follow the steps, knowing the steps and able to follow them consistently. Um, at a more minute level, it would be the ability to identify the type of engine, you know, the, the year make model of the vehicle and the exact type of engine that's in the vehicle, derived from that. How many liters of oil is required? The um, the weight of the oil required by that engine and that manufacturer. Um, the ability to communicate with between the above the deck and the below the deck person. Um, these would be all be written out as individual competencies. If you add them all up, you're a certified oil change technician, right? But there's not maybe one badge that says certified oil technician. It would be down at that lower level. Now, there is an ability to stack these badges together. So you could say, you know, what are the badges that go into doing the above the deck job? And what are the badges that go into doing the below the deck job? And you could roll those together in order to say, now qualified for the job. I thought that example was helpful and can illustrate it a little bit. Um, so policy-wise, what we decided to do so far is we're kind of in the trying to enable and facilitate experiment stage. And we know that in order to do that, we've got to kind of take one step out of the breach. And we've got to make somewhat of a commitment to you as the facilitator of this that we're not going to just turn and run and abandon this. So what we're saying for right now is we have this system and offering it to you for experiments is that we're going to, if you personally issue badges, so in other words, you log in right now, you create a badge, you're going to be personally issuing. In other words, if I give you a badge today, the issue by printing out there. Period. End of sentence. No other endorsement whatsoever. You know, facilitated by a system run by MSU. The MSU is not standing on this badge in any way, shape, or form. Great if I'm just trying to motivate you to keep coming to Fannie's plan. Something like that, right? Not so good if you're trying to get a job based on it. We're going to retain that data for two years, okay? And we're, you know, the day we decide to turn this thing off and replace it with something else, we're retaining that data that was earned the day before for two years from that point. Um, Unit issues badges. So if you go to Roger and you say, you know what, my <coughs> dean said I'm allowed to issue this badge. We're going to use this as an, you know, in addition to those PDF certificates we've been handing out so far. That we're going to retain indefinitely, and I have to make that statement because I don't know what else to promise you. Like, definitely, I don't mean forever. Good. <laughs> 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 more than two years. <laughs> 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 That's great. Because at the point where I decide to turn this thing off and replace it with something else, either we will crank out the whole database and, and preserve those URLs, even if it means just throwing a bunch of text files out at this URL indefinitely. Or anyway, we're having a discussion, probably based on who's with the people that used it and with people like Nicole, and based on what they used it for. Okay? So to be determined a little bit, but we're going to lean towards. Uh, retain those <coughs> for serious purposes, right? 
Um, oh, it's actually pinch. So this is the part. <laughs> <laughs> And you're being taped too. Watch yeah, this, is me, this, is, this is recorded. I may not have told you that, but it will be short and definitely. These are cheap. I mean, this is relatively small amount of data, so it's not like this is going to cause a huge problem. Other than um, someone's, you know, 20 years from now, someone's going to forget that this even exists. You know, when I retire, you know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, you know, the things that you inherit, and you're like, why? Why did you even say this? <laughs> anyway, now we can go back to the tape, and then you're like, ah. Just makes you want to kill him more. <laughs> uh, so this is what it looks like when you go to creative awards. I'm sorry, this font's really small, but you basically um, you name the award. So in this case, this example, I said this is a essentially we're trying to give you a badge of such you know how to assess risk in the cloud, moving up to data in the cloud. This is your description for the award, so it signifies that the individual understands key risk management dimensions. You know, lots of that fit on tiny box. I encourage you to write these in Word and cut paste them in. Mm -hmm. At least you can save, but also so that you can um, see more than three lines of that. Um, then you put in the criteria for earning the award. In other words, this, these are the specific things that our did in order to earn the award. And then you get the award issuer. And so this is an example. I, uh, this says actually IT service and teaching and learning. So this would be an example where theoretically, if I were to actually be doing this, I would have to go to somebody and get permission to use the organization's identity instead of my own. This is a badge issuer. So this is what it actually looks like if you were, you know, this is the batch that Ryan gave out on Friday for attending the ground bag. It basically just says that he participated in the, uh, that specific ground bag session. Um, that metadata takes you back to our criteria. So he put in a criteria statement in that previous game, screen. If you were to follow that hyperlink, it will take you to the badge system and will show you that criteria statement. Um, and there's an evidence URL. So in this case, the criteria statement is going to be unique to everyone that earned that version of the badge, right? So everyone that attended the ground bag session and earned the badge, they have the same criteria statement. They all attended the ground bag session. Mm -hmm. The evidence might be different. In this case, it would all be the same because it's blue when you attended mm -hmm. or you didn't. But if Ryan handed out a test after that session, if the, um, he might have set up R that said you have to pass the test at 75% or more or you don't earn the badge. Then that might be in, in the criteria. But the actual evidence that says, yes, indeed, you know, Brendan, as a participant in the session, passed the test above 75%. That evidence you are also going to be unique to me when I earn the batch and anyone else that earns the batch. Um, and so in this case, this is really, frankly, this came right out of batch that I was community use, so this is what it looks like. So in this case, um, if you were to look at the issuer, which is not on the screen, um, Brian would be the issuer. And it essentially says organization, staff, personally issued. This is what differentiates the beginner issue the badges from the personal issue. So these things are very much in the eye of the beholder, but that's kind of how we fit it in. So from a, from a policy standpoint, this is the interpretation of these right now. Um, I went over with a retention schedule, or, but to re reiterate, it's not transcriptable. Hmm. Probably should be used for motivational purposes primarily right now. Um, but we think that they're equivalent to essentially these type three certificates. So this comes out of, um, University Curriculum Committee policy at MSU. Um, that's the URL. You can, you can find the presentation so you know need the whole details. This is a little bit out of context, just slap on this one little se section of MSU policy up here. But there's four types of, of um, credit certificates. And what we're saying that these are equivalent to is type three, which essentially is like those PDF certificates that we can hand them out. So um, the academic unit has to figure out how they want to govern these. So your academic unit's going to have to figure out how they want just to work, especially if you come to us and say, I want to issue on behalf of the unit. We're going to have to go back with you and try to figure out who it is in the unit authorized this. And I think we're going to, right now, for the time being, expect that to come from your major administrative unit or college level approval in some shape, way, shape, or form or another. So you should probably talk to an underneath in some way, shape, or form before you come to talk to us if you say, I want to be a part of the But we're more than happy to come with you and help um, inform that conversation so they don't look at you like you're crazy. Um, there's still a bunch of challenges with this. Um, that is that I'm to you. you know, I talked a little bit earlier about how scary it is to retain stuff forever. So we're running that, continuing to run that system and, and feature versions of this as it evolves. Um, I think a lot of the participation data associated with that 
probably would be or could be covered by FERPA. To the extent that that's encoded in the Badger system, we think that the amount of data encoded in there is, is um, abstract enough. And because the learner has control over it, there's not a lot to be concerned about. But I would still be careful about how you represent the evidence and not get too specific about that. What we don't want to see probably is um, the actual um, student work product or the, the hard grade showing up in the evidence criteria. Setting threshold levels and saying, yes, they, they crossed the threshold level to pass <coughs> is, um, is the level at which you should be encoding your badge system. And that's abstract enough. And with the learner having control over it, I'm not just doesn't care for me. I don't think it's too much. But are, are, you know, if you're not sure, at the registrar's office. They're our official arbiter of FERPA, right? Um, you know, if you're used for corporate, do is that adequate record management? You know, maybe it could have been this place, probably not for you. So what else would you have to do? And is it worth all the work to go and write the criteria, do the assessments, and, you know, there's some tough bars to cross here in terms of deciding whether it's worth it. Um, and the whole degree of credit for one thing. I think there's a subgroup, academic group working on MOOCs right now, and the whole yep. thing about MOOCs and credit has come up a little bit in that group. Yep. Um, I leave it to that discussion. Someone should present on that at some point. I don't know what's going on there, but uh, let's just say, let's, let's hope the MOOCs get there before badges and, and then we can make sure I'm some things from MOOCs to badges. Um, so if we were successful with all of this, we would probably figure out a way to have some kind of co-curricular record to benefit some students and benefit the institution. Um, probably would have more and more competencies working their way into our accreditation processes. Um, where we see this right now, so actually starting is, is the, the professional programs. So in medical schools and nursing and social work, where there's um, a discipline and specific or professional association that essentially accredits the program. Um, and that's where the pressure on D2L and, and um, funding and all is, is heavy. And it's mostly the master's level, I would say, or the professional program level. Um, Possibly badging will help us demonstrate the value of MSU relative to all these upstart other alternatives. I don't know. Maybe. Um, I think the college has to have a decision-making process for the badge issue, right? So if you're able to do that, you're going to step closer to, I'd say, solving this and other things like it in terms of alternative credentialing. Um, I think if people ditch their PDF certificates and start using stuff like this, um, I think this is a better alternative. I think that would be a good example. I think anything where, where our, our participants are able to use alternative credentials like this as a way to demonstrate their lifelong learning, I think that'll help. And we see that with the MOOCs already. Right? The MOOC population is largely people with their own degrees <coughs> that have a career-based need for continuous learning. And they want to be able to represent that sometime. So anyway, and I don't have a lot of time. So any questions you have? I've got one, Brad. The, the, the badge itself, who creates the badge image? That's obviously not generated by the system. Um, nope, Scott Christ or somebody has come up with that. Um, do we have graphic standards and rules around what can be represented in the badge or not? I would lean on like university relations or sorry, communication branch training. Do you, there's certain things I would put in a badge. Like I wouldn't mess with the official trademarks. Um, with the, I don't remember the name of it, there's an official name for these things. But it's like the, the, the thing that has the power in it. <coughs> But the seal. There's this yeah, like so a seal. seal. Like, I wouldn't put the seal in a badge. Um, there's various things in the in the brand template right now, like the, the shield and the chevron and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't see why incorporating that into badges would be okay, so my, my question is right now there is no uniform standard for what goes in a badge. No, it's any it, yeah, pretty much So the approval goes. process would be inside the college to get approval to do it and yeah. then from there to uh, CABS for review before it's I don't think CABS is going to expect to review all of these. Um, no. I just think if you were to no. violate their existing policies around use of word marks and trade marks, <laughs> that they would come and smash you. Unless you dare to make a badge without running by it. All right. I, just, I don't know. Just I, don't think, well, I, I don't think that this is even on their radar. Oh, it is. I don't. Okay. It will be. I think if you, I mean, if you look at uh, the one from the brown bag, I mean, which is basically a brown bag and an apple. Yeah. Cabs isn't going to care yeah. about that. No. Right. Now, uh, you, you I mean, so I think as dangerous as this is to say, you know, sometimes common sense or ideas around that would might dictate some things. But yeah. if you had questions about it, probably better to ask. If, if it seems apparent that it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. You have guidelines around type 3 certificates right now in terms of what you can put on them and what you can't, right? right. 
So you can extrapolate some from that and some from Cavs existing use of Mark's policies. I'm looking at blue badge. There's no way I'm going to put it out until someone tells me okay, global or, or someone, yeah. so that I can put it because that, I just, that, that's not very wise. Well, yeah. you, you guys, if you doc, let's say, Dave, you do it now for right, Henry Center for Professional Development, and Lisa says, oh, I want to try it with the new alumni lens, some of those things, and you want to do it for professional industry program, and maybe you want to do it for food laws and regulations, you know, credit certificate. You guys would be early adopters. We would work together to support you through the process so you're not taking an undue risk of, you know, have causing a problem for yourself later, because you know, there's a certain amount of forgiveness you can get under the name of an early adopter, but you've got to do it with support, and you have to do it with some common sense and, and being informed by all these moving parts. So because you're an early adopter, it's not a set process yet, but, you know, help us make it a set process by providing some great demonstration projects of how you can really make it meaningful in the MSU context. Yeah, we've talked about this before, though, we'll the, to, to do it, and when, when, we, we, when it's run through they global, and it says, okay, you know, that's right, that's so, that's but, but that's actually, <laughs> but, you know, that's right, then at least we checked, we're not going yeah. rogue, that's right. and, and yeah. bounced it off. That's so. right. So one of the values, ultimately, will be having some kind of an MSU logo, logo in there, so yeah. at what point? But at what point, and, and where is the logo important? I'm kind of curious to see, because don't get too focused on the physical badge. All right, that's just, it's a branding thing, and it has all the branding things like you just mentioned. <coughs> but the competency is, and the certifying issuer yeah. are part of the data. Oh, and okay. so imagine yes. these in the future, yeah. maybe we create a tool, or somebody mm -hmm. else creates a tool, that harvests the competencies. Like if you wanted to know, let's say people start really using this, and it makes these competencies visible around the world, and you're looking for competencies for oil changers, you don't have to invent the wheel. You can go to the most trusted source with the most brand, well-branded trusted competency statements that you trust are aligned with those industry or behavior standards. We should be the place that they go to for the most trusted competency statements, and the most yeah. trusted issuer because of the quality of our assessment. Well, and the place that they the most competent people will come out. That's right. right. That's right. So that's where we build the brand. Let's not get too carried away with you know the picture and all that. That's not the important thing. It's what's behind it that builds the trust and the brand and our value over time. And that's a huge tool that was never available before, never possible. Now, I'm looking at you know, the motivation to get the first person to do it. And I'm willing to do it because we've worked together on things. But if there was the, the MSU Chevron and it had Michigan State around the outside, and then there was some basic guidelines for what could be in the middle, my motivation for more badges goes through the roof. Because yeah. if there was a common green Chevron that we'd know that every time you look at it, it looks, so if you, if then to be able to use that badge, you set a set of criteria, how many hours, general classifications, and I can opt in for that MSU system. So I could say personally, my motivation to create badges would go very high if there was a, a set image. So we can we can actually check with Pabs and build some kind of templates that mm -hmm. has some kind of MSU model. Yeah. 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 And I see Jerry and Rashad are now sweating a little bit over yeah. here because it always yeah, goes where go you need it. <laughs> Proceed until apprehended. That, uh, <laughs> that exactly my point. <laughs> I guess just one, just a reminder that badges can also be used just to incentivize certain activities in the course as well. So it's not just tying them to competencies, but you know, to also to encourage certain um, activity. Yeah, like we had um, in, uh, I think it was the MOOC course, one of the MOOCs we did last year, the Foundation of the Science MOOC. We gave out badges for that that were purely motivational. And as a result, like the criteria, not so useful to external parties. So you may not be able to read that, but the criteria for those badges say something the equivalent of you must pass the biology module quiz with at least 80% of the questions correct. Well, I didn't write the MOOC, so I have no idea what's on the biology module quiz. Therefore, I don't really care whether you pass it or not. I have no idea what that means. It's not transparent right? enough. Right. So that's an example of a not so useful competency externally. But on the other hand, to motivate people to complete <laughs> quizzes and all of them in order to earn the like super sub badge that says you completed the move, yeah, it serves its purpose. I see that was really useful for motivation, but when what's the time frame in which you guys expect it to be uh, able to, you know, be in a professional environment? Because you know, motivation is all good enough, but like when we can actually apply it and it has like you can get a 
certified batch or official batch, something that's going to add weight to it. What do you guys time frame on that? Where you expect that to be? A yeah, or is that based like on the future batch? So okay. probably. <laughs> I would put this, like, if you were to put it on the Horizon Report, it's probably on the Horizon Report, so yeah. I'll look at that and see my base. Yeah. That would be the analyst's uh, opinion of it. But um, <clears throat> my guess would be what, like three to five years? What do you think, Chris? I think it's going quicker. Um, as a follow-up to this, I'll, we're going to send a link to something I wrote back in November. It's called The Deeper Disruption, which gives uh, two examples, Kaplan and um, the, the place, that, oh, what's it called, Mighty, which yeah. are two. So you want to see what these can be rolled up into outside of MSU that would link directly to jobs, for example. Yeah. Um, imagine a company that's going to hire you because your badges match up with their job descriptions. That's what's being, that's available right now. Okay? Right. So I, I think it's, you know, it depends which industries adopt it quicker and creates the pull to jobs that will drive it. I mean, that's here right now. Yeah, and I think adoption is going to be really differential across yes. professions. Yeah, it's very, Just very good. Just to be embedded, PMG is very, like, well, I'm a tech person. I think you can recreate that very easily right now. Yeah. So, yes. Trying to figure out a way where you guys can, like, I don't know, make it a little bit more efficient. Yeah, and that's why we de declared the induction and retention on the badges system because mm -hmm. um, the only thing that allows you to certify that PMG is being able to go back to the hyperlink mm -hmm. to the badge system issue to verify that indeed the badge was issued. So that's um, a program. If I take down the system, that badge now becomes. Uh, Looks like a, a counterfeit. Do you only create these online, or is there a program that's like one that you can that can be downloaded on a computer, or is it only an online system? Right now, the implementations I know of are all online, oh. but um, mainly because they have that track tra track back URL. Right. But theoretically, you could have a desktop application that has an API to uh, web system. I just don't know if like that. I, I want to pause just for a moment. We can continue because I, I know some people need to leave at noon, or just a couple minutes past that. So um, please feel free to. Uh, collect your things, or, or if, if you have more time to stay, Brendan, if you're available, yeah, we'll exactly. continue the discussion. But uh, just hit the pause button for just a second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, round of applause for. Thank you. Thank you. So at least I think you had a question. I cut you off. Sorry. So anyway, that's the URL if you want to find this thing later. Yeah. Uh, because I'm in the alumni world, I have to ask about the question. Have you thought about alumni and, and what's going to happen? Because if we're driving something where employers are not going to be valuing these badges and our alumni weren't on campus when the badge system was in place, what's what's the plan to make them still be relevant in the work? They should come back to us for continuing education. <laughs> 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 that would be my personal view. But I mean, I think the reality is. Um, <coughs> You know, to the extent the alumni network also allows people in other place to represent their resume and, and right. connect. Um, I think from a consumer standpoint, the ideal would be they don't have to come back to us. They can go to anybody, but maybe they can still self-represent their way to learning through, uh, through the alumni network in some way. But I think for people that were around before we were handing these things out, what you'll probably find is there'll be like little startups that will start to um, certify your prior learning. Um, so prior learning assessment might become a bigger and bigger deal, and that might be how people that were in the prior learning can come right. back to essentially say, well, I want to go shop, but I don't know like the learning else. But the other hand, I'd also say, like I said earlier, if you're in the or changing careers is probably where this stuff's most valuable. In order to represent what you know, but don't yet have a body of experience to show off, um, I think most people that are in career, they rely more on, let me show you the things I've done as an example of what I know how to do. Oh, I, I agree. But I, I think the, the more experienced worker is always trying to find how they're selling themselves with these new trends that yeah. tend to catch fire. And yeah. I'm just curious if you had a way retroactively for some of these. Yeah. No, but what if you, yeah. as an alumni, what if you had an um, alumni lens prior learning assessment or something, or update your, you could, you could do a service in partnership with a group like Kale to do outcomes assessment of mid-career alums, map into industry standards depending on what their career area is. There's lots available. Some there's nothing, there's some there's a lot. It could be a service you guys offer for a fee. And that can then include not only industry standards, but things that MSU's been developing. Yeah. And you have, have to be an active to alum for, for it to verify as well. There you go. Yeah. Well, professional associations are definitely good this, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 the first one. So I know you talked about this before, but I think like, from a brand 
brain is finally just coming back around it. So I'm thinking about the scalability and the, and the reader aspect of this because I, I mean, certainly I can see if I'm an HR professional, I'm trying to sort through a bunch of people. I need some sort of reader that can kind of go through yeah. a pile of these somehow and like oh, where can <laughs> and match yeah. them up. So, and, and you mentioned something about where that was, but then I wasn't paying attention. So could you come back to the fact about, because I'm thinking about this, it's really nice, we're worried about the picture and the pictures are nice, but I think the pictures are really more motivational visual because that's not how yeah. an HR, a large HR firm is going to go through them, right? They're going to just read them and say, who in there has... <laughs> yeah, they're really more like fun at the time of earning, but if you think about it, if you're looking at someone's resume and they had a mm -hmm. thousand badges, yeah. are you really going to look at all the images? No. 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 Probably yeah. not. You're, you're going to have a computer to sort of work, right? So, so, so where is, where is, re is that, is so that like Catholic easy? So has created a reader. Okay. They've um, created a service. It's um, called, I can't remember the name of it, but if you search on, if you Google, Chris Guy's deeper disruption. You'll go to my store and find thing where I put a piece, couple of examples together. And there's a video of Kaplan showing what they created, and it's an HR dashboard that reads by goes out there and searches like a Google search, looks at the competency statements, and maps it up to whatever it is job they're trying to see. And it, it visually shows you the gaps between what you require and where that individual stands. And it does all the work for you. Like so, but there's no standards of requirements. So, because I'm just trying to think about some of the there's no standards of competency. Because I'm trying to think of how this works, yeah. right? Because I would say, uh, like, that's where the right. issuer comes in. That's so where the issuer is. Yeah. Right. So you so need yeah. a really good issuer so your competency statements match up with the standardized right. competency. And maybe yeah. that's where yeah. Teresa's yeah. business comes in. Yeah, it'll start off with like free text search of the criteria. Yeah. So if you're looking for like but project management better. skills, yeah. Yeah. you might look for anything that has to do with project management in the criteria statements. Right, right. But then, you know, like, uh, there's a professional association for project managers called PMI, right? Right. And the PMI actually released badges for their certification mm -hmm. regime. Right. All of a sudden, those would have like a thousand and one weight to do some free tech searches. Exactly. Right. Right. My brain just finally came back. This guy's not confused with that. You know, endorsement over the badges matter. So, so what it means is the incumbents who stand for quality in certain areas, like PMI, mm -hmm. is this industry mm -hmm. standard for project management or end industry standard. Yeah. They will automatically in the early days be the most valued because they're already a trusted brand. Just like right. MSU is a trusted brand. So but the earlier you are in the field as a trusted brand, the more valuable your credentials will become. Yeah. And if you know, if there's a top four, there may be someone who first mover of attention. Mm -hmm. Or whoever's in the top four gets that. Yeah. But maybe they're not. I don't like that. Well, do you actually define it? We're seeing like three years. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I can see two angles of delegated badges. One by the learner in terms of how efficient and enjoyable it was in terms of mastering the competency. And then another by the players who have played people with that badge and say, yes, I think that they really understood it. Yeah, I think organizations, employers have a big, a big space in this. Um, we are talking with Boeing, for example, last week, and one of the things they were saying is, um, exploring content that exists both on the internet, things that they've created, but things that have been created outside. So MOOCs are, are a common place to look for that type of content. And so, Julia, like you were talking about a standard. So what, what they were looking at doing is going and saying, all right, if, if I take this chemistry MOOC from uh, University of California, pick the system, doesn't matter, uh, we're going to say, okay, that, that meets these criteria. Therefore, we would, as we would assign this level of competency associated with that. And they hadn't thought about badges as a reputation of, uh, uh, a representation of that, but they're like, wow, that, that would be a way that inside our organization. So now imagine you're a mid-sized firm, and you're saying, oh, Boeing has endorsed this. Yes. Uh, there's a, there's a ba okay, there's a standard I can point to and say, ah, now my engineers have to do that, or my whatevers have to do that, or so it's interesting to see where that potential is. If you supply Boeing, right? So if you're a supplier of Boeing, Boeing requires exactly. that everyone who works for you meet the same yep. criteria. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, so a lot exactly to, how yeah, it's going yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, think about the recent requirements with Bell's has come out for uh, suppliers of beef have to meet certain welfare standards. So you can see how certifications and the dog recognizes these certifications. So you can see how it might improve food safety. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I think I mean I mean my comment is that if we look at this and just try to put our existing way of education on top of this new technology, we really missed the opportunity here. I really think that there's a lot of 
um, potential benefits, especially from lifelong education, where you can tie these badges just to activities and keep people engaged and keep people um, furthering their education. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we think outside the box. There's gonna be some aggregators too that'll pop up in the space too. So, I mean, obviously, it doesn't matter if MSU offers those to a certain extent if we don't get them in the places where everyone's looking for most. Right, and at some point, there will be places where people are looking for badges that aren't really providing their experiences or their assessment themselves, but are a broker for everyone else that is. And, and so I'd say if you're an early adopter of this, you may also need to be ready to jump into and force the institution to, to go through the deliberation about jumping into an aggregator at some point where, where you have people looking for educational opportunities that are competency certified. And that will be painful. For, yeah. so early adoption of this won't be so painful. Getting the institution through that wormhole will be. If you're not if you're not participating in a marketplace where where the public is going, Coursera is one of them for sure. Just because yep. of the virtue of early dot the first one in volume. If you're not participating in those sorts of like aggregators or channels, your stuff won't get seen. We've experienced that already with our own MOOCs. You know? right. So it's just it's you're not buying a platform with like a MOOC, for example. And there'll be other things coming soon, not just MOOCs. Um, but if you're not participating in those channel distribution channels, your stuff won't be seen in these marketplaces, and that could be a deliberate choice, or you, you can, you know, figure out how you can add value by participating. Yeah, but yeah, I think if you're not number one, you need to be someplace where you're going to get <coughs> mass effect. Yeah. Other questions, thoughts, concerns, issues. Thanks for sticking around. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.